Hello everyone and welcome to One Civil Law, where we learn through the misfortunes of others. If you're enjoying our legal education content, please remember to subscribe to the channel. It helps us grow. For today's story, we're unfortunately dealing with a really, really dark one. So this is not a uh, friendly one in any way. Sometimes law is a very, very unfriendly place and deals with very, very unfriendly stories and very sad stories. And so this is a story that is pretty, pretty dark just to, you know, set your expectations appropriately. This is the case of Karen Myers versus Cincinnati Board of Education. In this case, a third grader, um, what would be the best way of putting this? There is no really good way of putting this probably. A third grader um, self-deleted after repeated harassment and bullying at school. Repeated harassment and bullying that the school was aware of, failed to notify the parents of on a repeat, repeated basis, failed to do anything about over a period of years, and apparently as a result of this ongoing her campaign of harassment against this kid, the kid, the third grader decided to, you know, yeah. So we are suing the school district for basically massively neglecting their responsibilities to this kid ultimately resulting in wrongful death. So this is a dark one. There is no joy at the end of this rainbow, really. Let's get started with this. On January the 26th of 2017, third grade student Gabrielle Ty tied a necktie to his bunk bed and yeah. Two days before this happened, another Carson elementary student attacked Ty in the school bathroom knocking Ty unconscious for more than seven minutes. The bathroom incident was one of 12 incidences spanning from the first grade year at Carson Elementary until his untimely passing during his third grade year that the plaintiff alleged shows a pattern of aggressive behavior, including bullying at Carson Elementary, which ultimately led to this problem. So the, the, the allegation here is that he was attacked in the school bathroom two days before this happened. And this was but one of 12 instances that showed an ongoing pattern of neglect from the school. So we wanna sue the school for their failure to, to take care of this person that was under their charge. All right, so to figure out if we can do that, we need to learn a little bit more about exactly what the pattern of neglect was, exactly what are these instances and how bad and horrendous are they that the school failed to properly deal with in some way. So we have to go back in time and figure out what happened. So let's do that. The violent incidences Ty experienced at Carson Elementary began during his first grade school year. On September the 23rd of 2014, Ty was injured on the playground at Carson Elementary. The school informed Ty's mother that the injury resulted from an accident on the playground that provided no additional details. Although the school reported to mother that the injuries were not severe, the Ty's two front teeth were result, removed as a result of the injury. So the first incident, there was an injury on the playground and the school said it wasn't severe, but two of his front teeth had to be removed. So, you know, might be something worth looking into. Three more incidents occurred during Ty's second grade year. On October the 7th of 2015, a student hit Ty at school. Ty's parents learned of the incident after his death because no one at the school contacted them at the time of the incident. So there was a, there was a student on student violence and no one bothered to inform the parents of this. Subsequently to this, on February the 22nd, 2016, another student hit Ty at school. Although the school nurse treated Ty's injury, the school failed to even attempt to contact Ty's parents about that incident. Hmm. On May the 4th of 2016, an unspecified incident occurred on the playground involving Ty. School reports state that the school took some form of action regarding another student, but the school did not provide any record of any additional details. No one from the school contacted Ty's parents about that incident. They again learned about it only in discovery related to this case. The plans further alleged that bullying incidents at the school escalated during the third grade year at Carson Elementary. On September the 7th of 2016, school records show that Ty shoved and punched another student and school reprimanded him for that behavior. So they were willing to reprimand Ty for self-defense. 
That's good news. He finally stood up to the bullies and they're going to punish him. The plaintiffs alleged that Ty may have been defending himself from a bully by another student, as the details surrounding the incident are unclear, because the school records suck. Although the school records indicate that someone at the school left a voicemail with the mother, she denies receiving it, which, you know, in the context, I'm somewhat inclined to believe her. Further, the school failed to even attempt to contact Ty's father, who was also listed as an emergency contact. Three more incidents occurred in October of 2016. On October the 3rd, Ty and another male student were involved in an altercation. Again, although school records indicate that someone from the school left a voicemail with the mother, the school again failed to contact Ty's father, and the mother denies receiving a voicemail. On October the 7th, a student punched Ty, and Ty punched the student back in self-defense. The school called security and gave the instigator a warning, but did not otherwise punish the student for starting a fight. The school also warned Ty that he would be punished if he punched a student in self-defense. So they warned Ty that if you punch someone in self-defense, we're going to punish you, but we're not going to fail. We're not going to punish the instigators of this incident. No one from the school contacted either of Ty's parents to inform them that their child had been injured and told that he would not be permitted to defend himself. On October the 31st, Ty suffered a head injury on the playground. But Jackson and McKenzie, two of the plaintiffs here, were unable to determine what or who caused the injury. The school informed Reynolds, Ty's mother, about the injury, and she requested permission to view surveillance footage of the playground at the time of the incident. The school did not permit the mother to view the footage or provide her with any explanation of how the injury happened. So the mother's like, can I view the surveillance footage to show what happened? Nope. And we're not in any way going to explain what happened in any way. You can't view the footage and we're not going to tell you what happened. Good. Ty was at, attacked three more times at school during the weeks leading up to his unfortunate passing in January of 2017. On January the 9th, two students identified as CJ and PB attacked Ty and punched him in his mouth, for which he wasn't allowed to defend himself because the school wouldn't allow it. Good. Thus, finally culminating in the last of the 12 incidences. At 12.17, p apologize, at 12.11 p.m. on January the 24th of 2017, two days before Ty passed, a student identified as P.A. began violently attacking three boys in the school's bathroom. P.A. punched one boy so hard, he fell to the fo floor and curled up. Ty walked into the bathroom as P.A. was attacking the other boys. P.A. grabbed Ty's hand and yanked him towards the wall, causing Ty's head to collide with something. As Ty collapsed to the floor, the surveillance footage shows P.A. celebrating Ty's fall. As he lay on the floor unconscious, more than a dozen students passed through the bathroom, bathroom taunting and kicking Ty as they came and went. Well, this is going just about as well as, as, as could possibly be expected, right? This is super encouraging all the way through. So basically, for two years... This kid is being harassed, bullied, and beat up. He's refused permission to defend himself. The school fails to report majority of the incidents to anyone. They fail to try to contact the father at any time. They deny the parents the right to see surveillance footage to see what happened. They fail to punish the instigators of the bullying. They threaten him with if he defends himself. And it ultimately culminates in him walking into the bathroom, being attacked by another student, his head hitting something, and then a dozen students kicking him on the floor as he lies there writhing in pain. Things, things are not going as well as could be expected at this particular school district, one thinks. Yeah, let's read more. Ty returned to school on January the 26th, 2017, so two days after this assault and the day of his passing. On that day, the day he died, two boys again attacked Ty while he was in the school bathroom, stealing his water bottle and attempting to flush it down the toilet. Ty reported the incident to a teacher, but nothing came of it. Ty came home that day around 5.30 p.m. And yeah, so yeah. He told a teacher, and no one did anything. 
every prior incident the police that the, 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 the teachers in school did nothing they threatened him if he tried to defend himself that they'd punish him having just been attacked in the bathroom two days earlier when he's attacked in the bathroom again the teachers does does nothing and he concludes that the situation is hopeless yeah way to go school district so we'd like to figure out if we can sue the school district for this ongoing campaign of neglect when they are well aware of some fairly serious incidences and they seem to do nothing to care and only punish the innocent. Let's figure out if we can punish the school district. Okay. In addition to the instances involving Ty, Carson Elementary, beacon of education to everywhere, Behavior logs document routine, aggressive, and violent behavior among the student population throughout the 2016-2017 school year. For example, a third grader threw a chair and yelled at a female classmate. A third grader, a third grader threw a chair and yelled at a female classmate, I wish I had a gun so I could yeah, that's, that's great. That's super positive news. A student threatened to shoot a teacher and several instances of students attempting to choke each other. The behavior logs also include reports of students throwing furniture, pushing and hitting other students, threatening each other verbally and physically, using profanity, which is the least of the problems at this school, and in one instance, a student making a racist remark to an African-American student. Maybe the school has some indications that all was not well in the state of Denmark. Maybe there were some subtle clues that they should have paid attention to. Good. On August the 7th of 2017, the plaintiffs filed a complaint alleging federal and state claims against the school. Specifically, the plaintiffs assert state law claims of wrongful death, intentional infliction of severe emotional distress, which IIED, as I've said before, is pretty hard. IIED is pretty hard. But, you know, this is the kind of thing that IIED was probably invented for. So while pretty hard... If you're wondering, what would intentional infliction of emotional distress look like, Kurt? You have said many times that intentional infliction of emotional distress is a very hard claim. What would an intentional infliction of emotional distress claim have to look like in order to pass muster? This might be an example, just as an FYI. Negligent infliction of emotional distress, loss of consortium, failure to rep report child abuse, and spoliation for deletion of evidence. Excellent. So we, we want to sue the district for many, many things that they did many, many wrong things. And so what will the government claim? Will the government say, you know what, that was definitely our bad and we, we are really sorry. And, you know, we know that nothing can make up for it. But, you know, here we're willing to settle and here's a whole bunch of things we'll do. And we'll, we'll hopefully do something that will, will somehow make it right in the end in some way. Will, will, this, will the school district go with that? No, they're not going to go with that. They're going to go with we're immune because we're the government. We're from the government and we're here to help. I am encouraged. Let's read on. In this appeal, the government argues that they're entitled to immunity from the state law claims under Ohio law, the governmental immunity statute. The statute provides immunity to public school officials for damages for injury, death, or loss to person or property allegedly caused by any act or omission in connection with governmental or proprietary function. Excellent. We're immune. Nice. On appeal, the government maintains the plaintiffs insufficiently pled facts to show that this result was foreseeable. We had no way to see that that was going to come in any way. How could we see that coming? as is required to support a wrongful death claim. At the outset, the government vehemently denies there was any behavior amounting to bullying at Carson Elementary, much less student conduct that created a foreseeable risk that this would result. All right, let's just, let's just read that again and really appreciate it for what it is. You know, let's really appreciate what we're trying to argue here because I think we need to really appreciate this. At the outset, the government vehemently denies that there was any behavior that amounted to bullying at the elementary school. Oh, okay. Uh, all right. 
Specifically, the government argues that the plans failed to establish that the bullying was pervasive and repetitive enough to warn them of the possibility of self-harm. We had no idea that was severe or pervasive in any way. We had no clue. Uh-huh. They argue that bullying is defined as repeated targeting of a student or group of students by an aggressor or group of aggressors for the purpose of intimidation, violence, or harassment, emphasizing that it requires proof of multiple instances of serving a common malevolent purpose. This definition is derived from the anti-bullying statute. Okay. The Ohio statute that the government argues defines how bullying is used in that particular statute. So, the revi the, so this particular code says, as used in this section, bullying means this for the purposes of that statute. And the statute does not purport to set, set the parameters of whether bullying signifies this kind of risk. But even if the statute were conclusively a definition of bullying, the plaintiffs have adequately pled sufficient facts. So the government says, hey, there's this statute over here, this anti-bullying statute. And it says, this is what bullying means. It means bullying that is pervasive and by a common set of aggressors to, to, for a common malevolent purpose. And this, the district court says two things. First of all, that definition of bullying only applies to that statute by its own terms. It says, as used in this statute, this is what bullying is. That's not the global definition of bullying. That is the definition of bullying for this purpose. And even if it was the global definition of bullying, you know, you're kind of there. You're kind of there on these facts. Kind of seems like there might be repeated incidents for a common malevolent purpose. Seems like maybe that allegation is on the cards. Yeah. At the heart of the argument, the government asserts that they appropriately responded to each and every incident involving Ty. Alleging that the plaintiffs even admit in their amended complaint that the defendants acted consistent with school policy and intervened by suspending students who harmed Ty and by calling Miss Reynolds when Ty was injured. That is a gross mischaracterization of the factual allegations in the complaint. The plaintiff provided multiple examples of specific instances in when Jackson and McKenzie withheld information regarding safety and well-being as a student at Carfson Elementary and failed to punish the students that attacked Ty. They, they have massively mischaracterized and strawmanned the complaints from the parents of the dead child. Way to go. Additionally, Jackson and McKenzie failed to explain why they declined to call 911 upon witnessing Ty's unconscious state for more than three minutes. Video footage of the incident shows McKenzie arriving in the bathroom to find Ty unconscious on the floor. Mackenzie then stands over Ty, doing nothing to assist him for roughly two minutes until the school nurse eyes. So the government found the student in the bathroom, unconscious on the floor, and then stood there for two minutes waiting for the school nurse to arrive. Good. Neither the school nurse, nurse nor Mackenzie called 911, despite school policy requiring the school to seek emergency medical attention when a student is unconscious for more than one minute. That neither the teachers nor the school nurse said there's anything wrong with this, this student lying unconscious on the floor. This, this is normal. The policy placed Jackson and McKenzie on notice of the inherent danger associated with loss of consciousness even for one minute, much less the seven minutes that Ty was in fact unconscious. Yet they disregarded this known risk, instead choosing to minimize what happened. Lying unconscious on the floor of the bathroom. This is not a problem at the Carson School District. Encouraging. Encouraging. Not only did Jackson and McKenzie fail to follow policy, they also ignored the risk that Ty could develop delayed symptoms of a concussion or head trauma. Which, you know, once again... I'm not a medical professional of any kind, but I would think being unconscious for seven minutes might require some kind of further medical examination. Not an expert, but I'm thinking to myself, maybe this requires a second look. Just, just a thought, the unconsciousness for seven minutes might require some further medical attention. But the school nurse even doesn't do anything about it. Apparently the school nurse 
who has more medical training than me, presumably, comes to a different medically informed conclusion. So apparently I have come to the wrong conclusion because I am not medically trained. And the person who is medically trained, the nurse, thinks that lying unconscious on the bathroom floor for seven minutes is no big deal. So apparently my lack of medical training has caused me to come to the wrong conclusion. <laughs> Further, Jackson and McKenzie, the government, did not inform the school teachers of the January 24th incident or attempt to supervise the students' behavior in the boys' bathroom following the incident. Why would we need to supervise the bathrooms? What possible reason would we have to, to look in the bathrooms and maybe supervise them a little bit? This is hardly reasonable behavior for the school administrators, particularly those tasked with overseeing young elementary school children, or really children of any kind, but whatever. The fact that mobile students were attacked put Jackson and McKenzie on notice that leaving the bathroom unsupervised might be a problem. But we didn't reach that conclusion for some reason. Okay. Despite their knowledge of continued harassment and physical harm Ty suffered at school, Jackson and McKenzie, the government, maintain that this death from this third grader was not a foreseeable risk. Couldn't see that coming. As this court has explained, however, in a prior case, if the school is aware of a student being bullied and does nothing to prevent that bullying, it is reasonably foreseeable the victim of bullying might resort to self-harm, including their own death. Because that is a conclusion a reasonable person could draw. Maybe if we do nothing about the bullying even after they report it to responsible authorities. Maybe if we do nothing about the bullying, they will resort to self-harm because they might feel hopeless. They told a teacher and nothing happened. Maybe they're gonna feel helpless as a result. Could, could be. Unlike the school administrators in a prior case, these administrators knew full extent to which Ty was subjected to aggression and violence by his classmates. They even had video footage of several incidences of violence that Ty experienced at the school. Why does this school have video surveillance when they completely are unwilling to use it? What's the point of the video surveillance? One would imagine the point of the video surveillance would be able to like see what happened after it happened at a bare minimum. One would imagine that it would be there to be able to see what happened and then be able to do something about it. And so what is the point of the video surveillance when they have it, they reviewed it and they did nothing? What is its purpose? Further, the foreseeability of this incident in light of the violence and bullying is so apparent that school administrators' own safety guidance warns of this fact. They, the own safety guidance, their own guidance tells them this is a foreseeable risk. You should do something about it, and they didn't do anything about it. You know, there's that. The plaintiffs sufficiently allege facts to show the government acted recklessly. The plaintiffs have sufficiently alleged in their amended complaint that the government lied to the parents and chose not to inform the parents about six instances in which the physical safety was threatened. They didn't even tell you about it. They failed to discipline the students who attacked Ty at school. They failed to call 911 when Ty was unconscious for seven minutes after being knocked to the floor in a bathroom. They did nothing to put student teachers on notice of the violent attack that occurred on January 24th, nor did they take any steps to prevent future attacks of a similar nature. They reported false information about the number of bullying incidents that occurred as required by law and ultimately prevented Ty's parents from being fully understanding about Ty's horrific experiences at the elementary school until it was too late. This court finds this behavior as alleged to be egregious and clearly reckless, thus barring the shield of governmental immunity. Thus, that brings us to the end of the horror show of the case of Karen Myers versus the Cincinnati Board of Education at all. In this case, we learned that a student, a third grader, was repeatedly bullied violently, resulting in physical injury, including knocked out front teeth, including lying unconscious on a bathroom floor for seven minutes, and including other instances of verbal and physical harassment, and a school which apparently has massive verbal and physical harassment problems. And despite all this, the government failed to notify the parents about at least six of the incidences that occurred, failed to allow them to review the footage of it that existed, and failed to do anything to discipline the people that were responsible. And perhaps as a result of all this, the third grader concluded the situation was hopeless. 
because that would be an unfortunately reasonable conclusion for this third grader to draw in these circumstances. And the third grader thinking it's hopeless because they, they reported it to the authorities and the authorities knew and they were failed to be tr failed to do anything about it and they were failed to allow to defend themselves as they lie unconscious on a bathroom floor. As a result of this, the third grader decides to commit the ultimate act of self-harm. And the school says, we're not responsible. We had no reason to know about any of this. Yeah. So, um, no. Uh, you you might have had some reasons to know about this. You might have had some obligation to do something about it. This does seem a little bit more than negligent. It seems like reckless disregard and complete apathy and lack of caring. And yeah. So, for the moment, that brings us to the end of the horror show of this case. Thank you so much for being part of the Uncivil Law family. If you enjoyed this legal education content, please hit the subscribe button. It really helps the channel grow. We appreciate your continuing support. Until later, my friends, cheers and goodbye.